Many people assume that life in northern Maine shuts down in winter, after the lakes freeze and snow blankets the woods, mountains, and small towns. Those people are mistaken. While winter may transform the landscape, it also creates new opportunities for enjoying the outdoors. For visitors in the Moosehead Lake region, this means activities such as snowmobiling, cross-country skiing, ice fishing, snowshoeing, and a few unexpected forms of recreation that prove just how creative Mainers tend to be. Welcome to winter in Maine. Welcome to a different world. Explore New England is brought to you by your New England Ford dealers, your local REI co-op, REI believes a life outdoors is a life well lived, Geico, see how much you could save on more than just car insurance, and visitnewengland.com. Additional funding and support for this episode was provided by the Maine Office of Tourism and Destination Moosehead Lake. For someone used to visiting Moosehead Lake during the summer and early fall, mid-February can be something of a shock. The big lake, normally a rippling blue expanse, is frozen solid, often boasting three feet of ice, the islands floating on a sea of white. From the top of Indian Hill, all seems quiet. But as you descend into the town of Greenville, you can hear the two-stroke buzz of snowmobiles and notice ice fishing shelters dotting the frozen surface of the lake. And if you venture west along Route 6 to Greenville Junction on a select Saturday when conditions are right, you might be lucky enough to witness a uniquely main form of automotive competition. Well, this it's uh, West Cove Ice Racing Association. Um, we've been uh, we've been at this for over thirty years. Thirty you know, years? Yeah, I, <laughs> I've only been doing it about seven or eight years. But uh, you know, I moved up here, and then one day I was snowmobiling across the lake, and I saw some craziness going on over here. <laughs> Lo and behold, next year I had a car. I have a roller chain on the back, which is really off a conveyor belt. <laughs> And, but these are regular tire chains that you would use on a truck. I have a full roll cage in there. Mm -hmm. This is my co-pilot. And, <laughs> and actually- Does he have a name? Uh, is this, I don't know, but it's the smartest person in the car. <laughs> <laughs> and it gives me one extra horsepower. We're very, extremely weather dependent. We have to have uh, a minimum of 21 inches of ice. Uh -huh. And so depending on how the weather goes, this has been a great year. We've already done five races and um, we probably have, um, I don't know, between three and four feet of ice right now, so we're, we're doing pretty well on here. Every weekend we go through at least six inches, sometimes eight inches of ice, depending on... Wow, that yes. much? <laughs> so the, the corners keep getting banked out, and if, if we have really cold weather, then sometimes we can flood it. You know, we'll come out here, if some, some guy car is not working, everybody will pitch in, give them tools, oh. give them parts, you know, it, it's, not, it's not a cutthroat situation. Until we get on the track, then it gets a little <laughs> cutthroat. We have a four-cylinder class, and that's what's running right now. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we have the open class, which anything goes. Down the road a bit in the neighboring town of Shirley, Mark and Ashley Patterson were preparing for a very different sort of race when I called on them. The Pattersons raise sled dogs, a whole lot of them, on their property and compete in regional mushing competitions, including the prestigious Can-Am Crown. 
In the 2020 race, Ashley placed fourth overall in the grueling CAC 250, finishing the 247.5 mile course in 35 hours, 29 minutes. The way we go about selecting a team really starts from day one in the fall training. Once it gets hard, that's when you start picking out the guys. But they have to eat, they have to have good manners, you know, all these things that you're crossing your fingers that they should have. Um, but what if they have an off day? Because just like a human, sometimes people are tired, sometimes they're sick. Um, there's a lot of things that come into play. So yes, you do pick certain dogs that will be ideal, usually it's age. Um, and to tell you the truth, even though I've had dogs all my life, you're always wondering if you made a mistake. Every musher goes through the same thing of what if? Um, and a lot of it can really just be based on if you like the dog. That's really what it comes down to. You gotta like them. And that's what I always find interesting about racing. Everything's very you know, overwhelming in the beginning, and then you get out there in the woods where there's nobody but you and the dogs. You're just out there in the middle of nowhere, and you depend on the dogs. And hey, if they want to stop because you've entered a snowstorm, we've actually had scenarios where you've actually gone through 18 inches of fresh snow, and, and you imagine doing that as just a person. Now put that into the dogs' brains where everything gets really slow and boring. So that's why you gotta be really good at faking, like you're happy and you know, you're, you're always good at changing the mood of the dogs, along with even it affecting your own mood. A lot of people always ask, have you won? Not necessarily, but we're always placing in the top 10 or maybe even the top five. I guess I've always accepted that, hey, it's an animal, not a machine. It's more so an understanding it's a working dog, but yes, they, they would just assume be with you all their life. As I learned, there's a lot more to sled dog racing and sled dog raising than meets the eye. But then again, that was becoming the underlying theme of my winter visit to the Moosehead region. Despite its abundance of mountains, the Moosehead region doesn't offer much in the way of downhill skiing. One exception is Big Squaw Mountain, just outside Greenville. Established in 1963, the mountain is a great option for beginners and families with young children, although it does offer a couple of advanced trails. And the view of the lake and the surrounding mountains are well worth the $30 lift ticket. Squaw Mountain first started in December. It was 1963. It was a very active timberland harvesting. You know, Scott Paper Company was involved, a lot of local families. So it was really built to cater to all the local families that were living in Moosehead Lake at the time to come and recreate in their time off. So it started with the base lodge, which we started down below, and a tea bar and a few trails. And from there, it just exploded. In 1967, a double lift providing access to the summit of the mountain was constructed, along with a two-story hotel. After changing ownership several times over the next three decades and following a chairlift accident in 2004, ski operations on the upper mountain were closed, followed two years later by the hotel. The remaining lifts shut down in 2010. But that wasn't the end of skiing at Big Squaw. A new chapter was about to begin. The mountain sat closed for several years and we missed it terribly. The locals, my husband and myself, and in 2013 we approached the current owner at the time and asked if he would approve of a nonprofit taking over the lease. And he gave us our blessing. We've been here ever since February of 2013. The very best part about Moosehead Lake are our four seasons. Just about the time you're feeling like you need a change, there's another one right around the corner. Winter happens to be my favorite. I have the most free time and I'm able to come and spend it with my favorite people in the whole world. Today, Big Squaw remains an ideal option for beginners and families with young children. Although it does offer a couple of advanced trails and a terrain park 
all of it serviced by a three-person lift. In the main lodge, you'll find an equipment rental center and a cafeteria, or you can hang out by the fire pit. Big Squaw also includes cross-country ski and snowshoe trails that are open to the public, but true enthusiasts of these winter activities will find Nirvana a bit farther afield. In the heart of the 100-mile wilderness east of Moosehead, the Appalachian Mountain Club has recently acquired large parcels of critical forest and watershed land, as well as two former sporting camps. The camps, which comprise a series of rustic cabins, a communal bunkhouse, bathhouses, and main dining lodge, are available for group, family, and individual stays, and are open from late December through early March and from late May through mid-October. While most folks ski or ride fat tire bikes into the camps, a distance of some eight miles, I got a lift with Steve Tatko, the club's director of conservation and land management, who met me at the winter parking area with a snowmobile. The Appalachian Mountain Club is the country's oldest conservation group. We've been around since 1876, and we service the whole Northeast, up and down this, the whole Appalachian Mountain region. And AMC, from its inception, has always been about by putting people in direct contact with nature, uh, you're able to develop a really intense commitment to stewardship, environmental stewardship and an environmental ethic where you know, that outdoor recreation component serves as the gateway. So in 2003, AMC took a ginormous leap and bought this tract, the 37,000 acre Katahdin Ironworks tract from International Paper. And then that, that just that opened the gateway for us and we were able to acquire um, enough land so that today we're at 75,000 acres, soon to be 100,000 acres with, a, with a, another addition that we're working on currently. Now, this is a, the, the largest remaining contiguous forest left anywhere in the United States. Uh, it's 10.4 million acres. Uh, and, you know, I just, it, growing up here, the forest is, it just defines everything that we do. It's where we make our living and it's, it's, uh, it's how our communities are, are built and how uh, our, our lives are structured. So, you know, for me, it was, a, it was a wonderful experience. It still is to be able to run around on this land base, hunting and fishing and canoeing and cross-country skiing and snowmobiling and um, just really enjoying unfettered public access, uh, which is so unique uh, for a private network of lands uh, that exist here in, in northern Maine. Little Lyford is, is just a classic Maine sporting camp that started out life as a logging camp and then once the logging in the area was done in the mid 19th century it transitioned over into a, a, a sporting camp facility. So you've got a, a lodge where folks take their meals, you've got a bathhouse where folks use the, use the shower facilities and the bathrooms and then we've got a whole series of original cabins, some of them which date back to the 1890s, 1910s um, and that AMC has been committed to uh, rebuilding and maintaining. Backside of our lodging area, where folks store their skis before they go in and get a hot meal, we've got the, one of the original signs uh, for Little Lifer that goes back to the 1940s. Usually, people, you know, right about now, start to filter in there, and they'll hang out there till after meal time, and then they'll go back to their cabins. Mm -hmm. so. And actually, this facility is is the first facility that AMC owns anywhere in the Northeast that uh, that we allow people to bring dogs to. So it's a dog-friendly camp. And then, of course, you look down the valley, and we've got the whole cabin, all the cabin row. So we've got the cabins on this side of the hill bunkhouse in the ravine and then the the cabs right along the river up on the other the other hill. The next morning after a hearty breakfast in the main lodge I met up with Steve and Jen Ward AMC's business and community relations manager for a short cross-country trek south along the Pleasant River toward the famous Gulf Hagus Gorge. Cross-country ski trails uh, run the gamut from sort of classic New England trails that are, you know, that are narrow, maybe tracked experiences, to uh, broader skate skiing lanes. We also have 50 acres of glade skiing up on the side of, of Third Mountain, uh, which is accessible by sort of AT-style touring skis up to the top and then ski back down through. So it's, it's, a, it's a broad mix that covers a tremendous amount of terrain. Our 90 miles of trail are all groomed every day. It's the largest uh, free-to-the-public network anywhere in New England. Yeah, so this is a this is a brown ash tree, and, and we've got two different species of ash in Maine, white ash and brown ash. And for the Wabanaki, or the First Nations, the four tribes that still call Maine home for 12,000 years, this is central to their place in this landscape. So they're, there's a, they all four tribes share the same element of their creation story where Guskabe, the, the great spirit, shot an arrow into the brown ash tree 
and when his arrow hit the brown ash tree, it split open and people emerged. The Wabanaki people came out of the brown ash. So we've got a nice, strange little yellow birch that looks like it's been hit many times by ice right here on the riverbank. And on one of the wounds on the side of the yellow birch, we've got a chaga fungus, which is a, a traditional medicinal fungus that has been used by the First Nations here for centuries. It's been used for medicinal purposes for thousands of years. And it's just, and that's that's what's so great about these floodplain forests like this, where the river's right there, and this whole area floods several times throughout the year, so it's a very rich environment. This, you see this this really, really old yellow birch tree, it's probably three to 400 years old. And if you look around, you can see all these late successional hardwood trees. So we've got a big stand of, of really mature trees through here that this is what we're trying to develop the forest into through forest management. So I won't live long enough to see the, the forest look like this, but this is the hope that we'll have big old trees scattered throughout the forest and we'll continue to manage it. And this is storing carbon and it's also providing a wide array of habitat types for a huge number of species here in northern Maine. While the Maine wilderness offers no shortage of natural wonders to see during the day, a recent initiative by the AMC and the International Dark Sky Association hopes to preserve a phenomenon that can only be experienced after dark. When you look at a map of the uh, United States at night, this is the last dark space on the map. So it's us. When people come and stay with us for the first time, they're amazed at how bright and dense the stars are in the sky. They're just not used to seeing that. And the value that it contributes to their visit and to their well-being is just amazing. AMC's sort of focus on owning land here was to try to develop a, a new model of large land ownership where you combine purposefully forest management with landscape scale conservation and purpose-built uh, outdoor recreation. So, you know, when you come in and you experience this land base, you're, you're taking part in a massive 157 square mile conservation project. And it's, it's a pretty meaningful thing, you know, when folks show up and they, and they experience this, that, you know, you can, more, you can meld all these values into one uh, economic engine that, that is really bolstering the local economy here. Cross-country skiing is a fine way to get around the woods in winter, but if you want to cover some ground quickly, nothing beats a snowmobile, or a seaplane for that matter. John Willard, owner of the Birches Resort on Moosehead's western shore, has both. I met up with John shortly after my return from Little Lyford, and he took me on a late afternoon ride to Mount Kineo, two miles across the lake. With nearly three feet of ice under us, Moosehead was safe for just about any activity, including float plane flying. A licensed pilot for 40 years, John never needs an excuse to fly, and he couldn't resist taking his 1947 Piper Super Cruiser for a spin. For John and many other pilots in northern Maine, float plane flying is a tradition born of shuttling sportsmen into remote fishing and hunting camps. Indeed, the Birches itself started as a rustic sporting lodge in the 1930s, but now offers accommodations ranging from two-person rooms in the main lodge to large family-sized cabins, and is a popular base camp among snowmobilers, ATV riders, fishermen, skiers, and other outdoor enthusiasts. In addition, the resort's restaurant is well known for its delicious fare and ample portions, and serves as a gathering spot for locals and visitors alike. Moosehead Lake is big, and so are many of the fish that swim below its frozen surface. The lake holds landlocked salmon, brook trout, lake trout, and smallmouth bass, as well as perch and cusk, all of them targets of ice fishermen. In recent years, brook trout, some topping seven pounds, have been providing historic action for ice anglers. But it was lake trout, or togue, 
that were the target of Scott Dean and Les Harding on the day I joined them at their ice fishing outpost off Rockwood. Moosehead produces some Whopper Lakers, including a fish that nearly topped 30 pounds, taken back in 2009. It's togue of that size that keeps ice fishermen coming back to Moosehead year after year and competing in the annual derby that draws upwards of 3,000 anglers. Fishing on Moosehead's been great. Well, what they did was, uh, it worked. So there was a lot of uh, negative comments. People didn't know if the biologists were doing the right thing, but uh, the proof's in the pudding. Vexilar is a, it's what they call a flasher, but it's kind of a fish locator. You can tell if there's a fish down there. And if, it, if there's a fish down there and he's not biting, um, I'll work him a little bit and I work him up down the water column a little bit. If he still doesn't bite, I switch out lures. Oh yeah, baby! <laughs> awesome! Sweet. Oh, good. All right, we got our, we got our, we got our lunch. Woo! <laughs> While we never bagged any record-sized togue, the highlight for me was the on-ice fish fry presided over by Dean Hardy. I'd say that was a pretty good way to cap off my action-packed winter visit to a part of Maine that knows how to have a good time when the snow flies.